Welcome to Sisters in Crime's Murder Monday, where authors talk all about their crime craft. My name is Jack, and I'm a copywriter, occasional broadcaster, award-winning podcaster, and member of Sisters in Crime Australia, where we've been celebrating women's crime writing since 1991. My guest for this month's Murder Monday is Melbourne author Kylie Orr, who has two highly praised novels to her credit. Hey, Kylie. Hi, thanks for having me. This is going to be so fun. <laughs> Carly's debut novel, Someone Else's Child, yep. was long listed in the Rochelle Prize, the MS Lexi International Novel Competition, and awarded the Dimmicks and Fiona McIntosh Commercial Fiction Masterclass Scholarship. Over the past 15 years, her feature articles have been published in The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald, Daily Life, and Across News Limited. She shares her home with her family and a cat called Alfie who dominates her camera roll and her reading chair. Kylie, could you give us the elevator pitch for your latest novel, The 11th Floor, because it's got the best tagline ever? The, yes, and I didn't even come up with that. The best <laughs> tagline, that is, the view is a killer. Uh, so The 11th Floor is about Gracie, who's a new mum. She's got an eight-month-old baby who doesn't sleep and she's not coping her husband suggests she has a night off in a hotel by herself so she can catch up on sleep and just not be responsible for anyone for that night. And maybe she goes to the rooftop bar. Maybe she meets someone. Maybe she ends up in his room and she doesn't remember how she got there. And then as she's sneaking out, she witnesses a crime and she can't report it because then she has to say she was in someone else's room. So the crime she saw was from the 11th floor. Yeah. And then it's kind of the unravelling of Gracie. It is an incredible <laughs> unravelling, I have to say. Because <laughs> when I when I first started, I was like, oh, yeah, I kind of think, no, I don't know where this is. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I've been getting a lot of messages as people read it, like, you did what? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, sorry, it gets worse, actually. <laughs> but everyone's okay in the end. Everybody who needs to be okay is okay in the end, aren't they, Jack? Well, there's no spoilers, no spoilers, no spoilers at all because they're going to have to go out and get in and read themselves. Yeah, they so are. We, best... we won't spoil anything. No. And we'll talk about the writing process. So how many okay. drafts do you do before you hand your novel in? That's a really hard question to answer. I'm not a planner, so yep. I just sit down and write and see where the characters take me. And that is mm -hmm. an extremely messy, chaotic way to write. And yep. that makes editing hell. But it also makes editing exciting because then you see it take shape. So drafts, there must have be at least four, five, six, I don't know, by the time I hand it in. Mm -hmm. And then obviously it goes through the editorial process, which is another two to three, sometimes four drafts, so maybe ten all up. <gasps> oh, my goodness, that sounds like a lot of hard work. Well, some people edit as they go, but they're much yeah. slower writers, so I guess then it's it's a more polished piece when they hand it in, whereas mine starts off very messy and for me to get it to polished, I have yeah. to do more work to it. But, yeah, I prefer to write that way. What is your top writing tip? My top writing tip is to sit down and keep writing all these people <laughs> talking about writing a book jack that i've heard of that maybe find lots of other things to do if you want to get a book published you have to write it all the way to the end <laughs> even if it's terrible because that gives you something to work with if you keep getting distracted and find other things to do tiny objects probably. rabbit holes maybe maybe so i would just say keep writing just ignore all the other stuff ignore yeah. your family ignore the imposter syndrome you know ignore or your your day job you yeah. know just keep writing that's <laughs> practical isn't it <laughs> who, who are your writing inspirations oh writing inspirations yeah do you mean authors I admire or look it can be anything process? anything uh I mean, my favourite authors are Gillian Flynn and Lionel Shriver. Uh, yeah. Lisa Jewell's up there as well, actually. She is uh -huh. a more recent discovery for me. I didn't really know about her. Um, so I really love all their styles of writing. Writing inspiration, 
Do you know the author Kylie Ladd? Yes. I'm very impressed by her. She is a meticulous drafter, Mm -hmm. planner, and she polishes as she goes. So by the time she hands it in, I don't think she's had to do many drafts. I find that very inspiring. But Is is that sort of aspirational as well? I I don't think so for me because (laughs) I don't think this book would have gone to the weird and wonderful places it went if I'd planned it. Yeah. So I think to me it probably is a little bit op- oppressive for my creative process. But mm-hmm. also Kylie is up to many more books than me, so she might have like perfected the art a little bit better. So maybe by the time I'm at book five, six, seven, yeah, maybe I will be more polished in my drafts and plan a little bit better. But for now, I like I'm the, too I like busy. yeah, I like the idea of scaffolding. It's like you yeah. put things up, but then you can take them down and put them somewhere else. Or yeah, you exactly. can just run around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just having some vague idea would be great. I mean, that yeah. would be better than what I, I mean, I start with like an idea and maybe a character and that's about it. <laughs> so yeah. You see that? That I love. Do you? Does your main character maybe. ever surprise you? I'm thinking in the case of the 11th Ooh. floor, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there were quite a few chapters I left after writing it thinking, oh, that's a bit like my adrenaline was pumping, thinking, have I taken this a little bit too far? Um, But, you know, it's gone through all editing process and the publisher was like, whoa, yeah, okay, and no one told me to pull it back. So I feel like Gracie did surprise me many times. Yeah. But I think it makes for a more suspenseful suspenseful story. Absolutely. Oh, how important is place in your writing? I mean, obviously the setting for this, you know, the incident takes place in a hotel, so that's very important for the story. Uh, I don't think in this particular story place is as big a deal as it is in other stories, say Joe Dixon's Set in Tassie, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and my first book was set in a country town and that was really important because mm-hmm. I needed the community um, rallying together for the family. Yeah. Um, but this this is just kind of set in Melbourne suburbia, but the hotel was obviously vital. It was a vital plot point. So in that way, very important. Well, here, so I think we've already answered this one. Do you start with the plot of the character or something else? <laughs> oh, I start with just a big mess. Just a big mess. <laughs> An idea, vague idea, and then I just, yeah, literally follow the character where they take me. And sometimes I end up going to a dead end and yeah. taking another the, path. Do you remember the vague idea you started with for the, for the 11th floor? For this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I have four children and none of them slept. They were all terrible, terrible sleepers. And so even though they're now I've got two adult sons and two teenagers, it is still etched inside my brain, that sleep deprivation. Yeah. And when my eldest was at kinder or preschool, I don't know what each state call it, um, I met a woman who is still my friend now and she was taking a week off by herself. She's a lawyer. Yeah. And I just thought that was the weirdest thing to do. Like, yes, take time away with your husband, get your kids babysat or go away with your friends. Yeah. But to go by yourself was so odd to me. So then I tried to piece together the two things. What would happen if a tired mum had a night off, not a week off, yeah. and then something bad happened on that one night that she got to spend alone. And I originally called it One Night Alone, um, yeah. which I thought was a great title, but I'm not very good at titles. And I think my publisher was a little bit like, mm, I think that's giving the reader the wrong idea. I think they didn't say it, but I feel like they thought that was more erotica. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're doing on your one night alone, Jack, but that's not what I was doing. So that's why That's why well, it, I thought of that title. But, you know, it could work. It could work in other genres. Technically, she's not alone. Um, you know. Correct. But she did intend to have one night alone. That was yes, her intention. That was the dream. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes things don't go to plan. No. Oh, my goodness. If, if I'd gone to plan, it would have been a very short book. It would have been. Probably boring too. (laughs) How important is connecting on social media or through newsletters with your readers? 
uh, for me, very important, Mm -hmm. but I choose my social media. So I really feel at home on Instagram. Yeah. I I tried TikTok, very bad at it. (laughs) Um, The publisher kind of gently, gently said to me, "Mm, I feel like we have young people here who can do that. You don't. (laughs) They were, I think they were trying to say, if you're not enjoying it, you don't have to be on it. Yeah. Um, but of, of course, I was like, do you think I'm too old? Are you telling me I'm too old for TikTok? No, 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 we didn't say that. We just said, if you don't love it, I really like looking up different yeah. things on TikTok, but me doing the videos, I don't love it. Um, so Instagram, I have a really engaged audience there. I love it. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of, yeah, good banter and conversations and um, Facebook, I'm not great at. And then I have a monthly newsletter that I just started last year that goes out once a month called If I'm Honest. And I really like that too, because I feel like it's giving newsletter subscribers a bit of extra value that you don't get on your social media. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're going to sign up to a newsletter, how many emails do we get in our inbox? Like you want to make it worthwhile, you know? Yeah. No, that's fantastic. (laughs) Why do you think crime is such an appealing genre? Uh, I think it's escapism. Mm -hmm. I think that we all live a little bit vicariously through bad people. Like we don't want to be the bad person, Mm -hmm. but we're somehow intrigued. I guess it's like why you slow down when there's a car accident. You're not slowing down because it's dangerous and the police light's there. You're slowing down because you want to get a little bit of a a A lucky loo. Yeah. You want to check out what's going on, even though no one is willing to admit that. Um, I think crime is the same. And I, I live such a sheltered, fairly boring life. So, mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, excuse me to my husband and children. You're not boring. But you know what I mean. Like I I live a domestic life with four kids and yep. nothing that exciting ever really happens. So crime, hello. I mean, when my husband goes away on the couch with a wine watching like true crime documentaries, I'm there. Like I am, yeah. Uh, do you back to back? Dead. Back to back. Do you watch them back to back? Uh, I mean, if there's a a whole season, I will. But, you know, I do sometimes also need to mix it up with a bit of Married at First Sight, like just to turn the brain off. So I do, you know, I'm a very complicated, complex character, right? I don't know. I I think maths is criminal, really. (laughs) It is criminal. That's true. It could fit in the crime. It could fit in the crime genre. It's terrible and I love it. And when I sit on the couch, everyone in my family leaves. They're like, this is the worst show on TV. I'm like, I don't care. I'm here. I'm here for it. You get the whole so, yeah, I mean, yourself. Yeah, exactly. So, yes, maths is one escapism and crime is the other. <laughs> I love it. So what triggers a particular theme? So we've got someone else's child with the, the small town community and um, not giving anything away because it's an absolutely brilliant book, but it's about a community rallying around a family with a sick child. So yep. anything that triggered that particularly? Uh, I think I live in the Yarra Valley of Victoria and mm-hmm. my particular township, I'm sure most people can say this about their communities, but I have been a part of and observed many fundraisers in my yep. community and they do. people do jump in to help people in need, um, and which I think is amazing. And I did really want to explore that. But then I also wanted to explore the idea of what happens if money is raised, but it's not spent where the people promised. Then what happens there? Do you do you demand your money back or do you give it with, you know, goodwill and however they choose to spend it is how they choose to spend it? Or was it, you know, raised for one reason and not spent there? And then I also wanted to explore a little bit of, our judgment of women and mothers, particularly in different scenarios. And obviously the, the mother in someone else's child has a sick child and she's behaving in ways that are making people a little bit suspicious of her. Yeah. And also just, um, I I felt like let's explore that judgment a little bit and say, hang on a minute, she's got a sick child. Let's give her some concessions here. What is your favourite crime character? My favourite crime character? Oh, God. Oh, that's too hard. That's like choosing your favourite child. My favourite crime character. I can't answer that. 
You can't. Because then it's going to be unfair to all the other crime characters. <laughs> I don't know. I've got so many in my brain. I'm trying to just focus on. Do you want to? Do you want to give us like five? Oh God, no! I'm going to have to think about it. I'm going to have to come back to that. <laughs> I'm really going to have to. I mean, I love Michael Robotham, everything he writes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Are you, are you a Miss Marple or a no. Poirot? To none Poirot. of the Poirot. No. Radio. So none of the golden age. You like the modern crime? Vintage modern. crime? Modern crime? Not vintage. Modern. Uh, yeah. A little bit evil, but. I don't know, a little bit quirky. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to come back to you, man. Okay. I can't. That's not a problem because we've got we've got like a whole stack of questions. We can keep going. Okay. <laughs> oh, this one's easy. What is your writing routine? My writing routine is get it done while the kids are at school. So, you know, I have limited time frame. So I try to work in school hours. Yeah. I sit down at the keyboard at nine o'clock and I will get admin out the way unless I'm very, very entrenched in a scene or a chapter. Mm-hmm. And then I will just go with the role. Um, if, I, if I'm getting a bit stuck and can't get something to work, then I go and do things that are still writing related but don't require the same part of my brain, I guess. So I'll do yeah. Editing or newsletter content or I'll do social media or emails or whatever and then I'll go back to writing. But I find deadlines are a really good motivator. Yeah. Yeah. They get you they get you moving, don't they? <laughs> they do. <laughs> and I suppose I suppose um so you treat it like a full time job. Absolutely. Yes. So I did I was um freelance writing for many years. So I was yep. trying to do paid work around um being an author. Um, but then I started to try and just put a lot of energy into my books. And yeah. luckily I have a hu- husband who's happy for me to do that. I think he's waiting for me to like get the million dollar deal or something. <laughs> like he thinks he's going to retire on this. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I <laughs> I do treat it like a full-time job, but I'm yeah. probably not yet earning a full-time job. And and how how long have you been doing that full time rather than your freelance as well as uh probably probably since I got the book deal so I got the book deal October 2020 Mm -hmm. and so then I kind of felt like I actually need to commit to this like now I you know I have a contract I have a requirement to deliver a book of a certain standard Mm -hmm. and it was a two-book deal so I did one and also it took me a long time to write the first book yeah. From idea to book on the shelf was seven years between I like having the idea and getting a book deal. And but you were to, also I, working. Exactly. And raising yeah. four children and doing other things. But um, it was more about the fact that I wasn't on deadline for that book. Obviously, your first book, you never know if it's going to get up. So, yeah. But once the second book came, I knew that I would be under the pump because all of a sudden I would have to get it there by deadline. So it was a slightly different approach, I guess. I knew I had to buckle down and couldn't stuff around and get procrastinate, get procrastinated. I don't think. No, look, I'm, I'm totally picking up. I'm, I procrastinate, I procrastinate, I procrastinate, I procrastinate work. So, you know. Yeah, yeah. you've got it all. You've got it all. (laughs) And do you enjoy the writing process full time? I love it. Yeah, Yeah. I love it. If I could just um, block out life admin yeah. That's all I would do. I would just write stories, random stories, short stories. Yeah. Freelance novels, children's books, chapter books. I'd write yep. them all if I could oh, just be that fantastic. sort of eccentric person sitting there writing. But apparently I have children that I chose to have that I have to tend to. Require stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Occasional <laughs> driving to sports. So, yes. Um, yeah, I love it. I love the writing part of it. How Even much on the re- bad days, actually. Oh, you see, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. How much research do you do before writing? Considering you're a pantser, yeah. do you do research, research on the fly? or I do research on the fly because I don't know where the story is taking me. So I, I can't give it away in this book or the other one. But, yeah, yeah, I had to do research sort of 
halfway in. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a medical thing that happens, and I'm not sure if that is actually a legitimate thing. So I had to. I do have a sister in law who's a GP, so that's very helpful. So it's handy. I mean, I, I've I've got a sister who's a doctor too. It's amazing how how many oh. different ways you can die. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Dumb ways to die ad. Remember that ad series? <laughs> Public transport. Um, it's like, oh, we're almost out of time. Are you part of a writer's group? Yes, I am. And how so important I, are they? Oh, imperative to me. Yeah. I'm actually in a, a couple. So I did Fiona McIntosh's commercial masterclass um, years ago. And so I have a group of very supportive writers in that. Yeah. Uh, I originally started off with a writer's group in children's writing because that's what I wanted to do. Um, and that was just at my local library and that mm -hmm. was fantastic. Um, and now I am part of a group with Eliza Henry-Jones, Kylie Ladd, um, Caitlin Fant. There's, there's a few in there, yeah. but you might not know all the names, but um, they're very good. They don't necessarily read everything, the whole manuscript, but I might send scenes or openings or synopses or something that I'm stuck on and they can help with all that and also they know the industry well so they cheerlead and encourage and you know give space for venting at times when you might need to do that but yeah <laughs> I think they're vital actually yeah and lastly how would you get away with murder um I would just pretend to like be just a mum in like a, a Kia carnival. And I mean, I did have a Kia carnival and it had tinted windows and we used to call it the mafia mobile. I would um, chuck a body in that. Maybe in the, the exercise bag where you put all like the soccer balls. And stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. They're quite long, cover. those bags. Yeah. yeah. It's like no the cricket kit at Kia carnival. Yeah. <laughs> The kit bag with the wheels even. You could get yeah. one of those. Yeah. No one's Save pulling you, you over. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I do it. Thank you so much for joining us, Kylie. I hope the 11th floor sells an absolute mozza. Murder Thank Monday you. interviews. I hope so too. <laughs> Murder Monday interviews are available on Sisters in Crime's YouTube channel at 6 p.m. once a month on a Monday. Kylie or the 11th floor, thank you so much for your time. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Thanks for stumping me on that question. I'm going to have to go up and email you now <laughs> and think about them. <laughs>